Welcome back to Fake Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is our Global Connection Series. Today, we're going to talk about a transformative experience in Okinawa. Uh, and we're going to ask, what can we learn about living to 100 years old? Whoa, what a question. Um, I've been asking that question of myself for 100 years. So far, it's worked fine. <laughs> and for our guest today are two people who went on a trip, um, you know, a great trip with a, a group of 18 people from Hawaii. Uh, Alan Okinaka, who is a retired uh, GTE manager from the Big Island, um, and uh, Gwen Nose, who is a retired Navy educator, uh, uh, joining us from uh, Manoa. Uh, welcome to the show, Alan and Gwen. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. So you went on this this tour with uh, Art and Marine Kimura uh, and, um, and a dozen other people. And uh, why did you go on that tour? Uh, was there any particular reason that made you want to? I love travel shows. Was there any particular reason that made you want to go? Gwen, you tell me first. I I had heard about the Blue Zone uh, Village from Art and Reen Kimura. And so I saw it on Netflix and I was really impressed. Uh, I, I watched a, a couple other episodes on Netflix for the other locations. And um, I was curious, but it wasn't. Um, until Alan had said he really wants to go and to get a group together to go. Uh, and, you know, there was kind of like um, not enough interest, and then there was interest. And so it took a while for us to get it started, but it's because of Alan that this came to pass. And I, I don't regret it at all. I would go again. Alan, are you, are you a troublemaker or what? Why were you advocating for that? Well, I, I, and I read a lot about uh, Dan Buettner's uh, study and all the different areas where people live to 100. And the funny thing is in high school, and I'm not really sure why I did this, but um, a lot of my classmates heard me talking about living to be a 150-year-old person. Uh, it was a topic that was kind of interesting. And at that age, we have other more fun things to think about. But for some reason, I kept on saying that. And uh, when this Blue Zone thing came up, uh, I really latched on to it. I read all his three books. Um, I, I was intrigued by his uh, uh, overall uh, the indicators of um, uh, eating healthy, exercising, and having a purpose to live. Uh, so I really latched on to that. So that was one of my bucket list items. And the uh, other bucket list item was to go back after living, leaving uh, Okinawa 60 years ago. I wanted to meet up with my karate sensei and talk story. Yeah, so are you still doing karate? What's that again? Are you still doing karate? Uh, no. After I lived, I left Okinawa 60 years ago, I studied, um, we call it studying. It's just practicing for about 10 years. And uh, I reached the level of um, second degree black belt, but I never did study after that. Okay. You seem like a nice person. And I'm, so I, but I wouldn't get into a fight with you anyway. I mean, uh, okay. So now this, this is part of a thing called Get Lost Tour. When what is Get Lost Tour? Oh, uh, well, it's Art and Reen Kimura's idea. And it was kind of like relax and go and explore. And if you get lost, actually, I, I kind of enjoy getting lost. <laughs> but it's a little more freedom to explore. You know, you're not really tied to a uh, such a tight schedule and walk a narrow line. Um, so I, I'm kind of a get lost kind of person anyway. So I really enjoyed the concept. And by the way, there were 20 of us, including Art and Reen. Okay. Yeah. yeah. They're the mindset. They're the geniuses behind all of this. Yeah. Well, they're very, they're very active and affable. So um, question is this blue zone thing. Is this, is it, does this mean like, it's like a blue zone, a blue zone state where it's all democratic? <laughs> 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 Why do they call it a blue zone? That's Dan Buettner's uh, labeling of, of um, an area where people live to 100 and over in great quantity, a uh, great number. So were you guys interested, you know, in learning about how they did that? And 
you know, and exploring what was in uh, Butin's books. Um, and in, you know, living to 100, uh, I, I know that, uh, Gwen, you had some family that lived over 100. Huh? Um, so uh, were you, are you trying to get the tips and tricks to do it? Because we're, we're going to explore that here um, on this show so everybody will know how to do it. But is that why you went? Or was it something else in, in your travel aspirations? I was curious. I really didn't know what to expect upon uh, visiting them. I had thought we would go to be like spectators um, visiting the village, watching people live their lives and then finding out from them possibly, you know, what, what's the secret. But then when we went, we didn't go to visit their um, homes. We sat in a center uh, with uh, six of them, eight of us. And it was kind of like we sat and everyone's so shy. And the interpreter, um, uh, we introduced ourselves and interpreter um, translated. And so we were kind of kind of just wondering and kind of watchful of what's happening next. And then Art and Green did some science um, uh, activities. It was so much fun. So it kind of broke the ice, uh, two activities, actually. And then we um, had lunch together. Everyone's still quiet. One woman... Um, through the translation said that was her first time being part of this group and um, a resident. And she was said, I am very shy, but I love to dance. And so that was cute. So then we went through the day eating lunch and then we um, played a game, sort of like a porn hole game, but it was actually rolling a ball into holes uh, on this board and competing against each other. And that was fun. Um, they said they had created that game. And the next plan was for us to go outside to play a uh, gate ball, which is their passion. And they excel in it because this well, one of them said, I love to play gate ball. So she was ready to go. And then it canc- we had to cancel it. They had to cancel it because it was overcast and muddy. So what do you do? And, you know, I don't know why, what, Spirit moved me to say, I can do a hula. So I told Art, I can do a hula. And he doesn't even know if I can dance. He just said, okay. And so um, I want to go back to my little grass shack. Uh, I said, do that. And that's kapahale. So, you know, easy to translate, do the hand motions, explain all of the motions. Then I danced it with music. I am very rusty. It's been decades since I danced. Um, my kumahula was my ki ayu. Um, and so I danced it, and then they got up to dance behind me. So, you know, they seemed to really enjoy it. And the thing was, they got up, nobody holding onto chairs and struggling to get up. They got up and danced. And that was amazing. You know, I didn't see any walkers or any uh, wheelchairs. They were elderly. The people you were with were elderly. Uh, you mean that our group? No, the people who got up to dance, yeah. A 102-year-old man, and the other man, I think, Alan, wasn't he about 100 also? Uh, No, he was uh, 92. He was 92. Get up, dance, the women, um, no problem. And they were open to do it. And then they taught us an Okinawan dance. And we all had fun because they could teach us. And then we danced another Okinawan dance that I think they do as a celebratory thing where you the music's on and you do any motion. And it's so much fun. You know, everybody just making up as you go. That was a lot of fun. We're all is that like a bond? Is that like a bond dance? Yeah. No, um, yeah. not really. Ah, it, was, um, uh, it was free form, freestyle. Anybody do anything. Yeah. And well, was, in a little while, we're going to ask you to at least give us the hand motions for the hula. <laughs> okay. We have hula. We have karate. We're, we're in great shape here today. Uh, so, Alan, you know what? You were ready to observe carefully what was going on, to examine the lifestyle, the people in uh, in the blue zone, uh, and to learn or confirm what you knew already. Can you give us a primer on how they do it and what you learned from them? Well, that that's the part. Oh, by the way, um, uh, get lost, or uh, it was a really really good title for our trip because I be, I like. Um, what I call serendipitous touring. 
where I go to some somewhere I don't know and I just follow my nose the whole day. You run into people you've never met. You run into situations that you some you like, some you don't. And you come back and you know you feel like you had a really great day. So get lost is very similar to serendipitous touring. Um, but for me, I was given the privilege, I say that because um, I was allowed to not have to dance hula with Gwen, but observe the people interacting with uh, us, uh, with the people from Hawaii. And it was very magical to, to see that. Um, there, there was no, um, well, I, and I'm an engineer. And so whenever something happens, I try to break it down and think, okay, how did that happen? Why did it happen? How does it happen? That kind of thing. But there was not that kind of a thing. I, in fact, I asked the, uh, the tour guide if I could ask, well, if she could interpret for me and ask them, why is the purpose of living so important? Uh, that's Ikigai. And she was trying to explain to me that they don't think about why or how or what. They just live. They just live. They don't, they don't live to grow old. They live to live. And I, I know it, it doesn't, it's, it sounds a little strange to say it that way, but they're not worried about dying or anything. They, they're focusing on living. Um, I befriended a, a gentleman. His name is um, uh, Yonosh, Yonoshiro Takeshi. Uh, he's 92 years old, speaks fairly good English because uh, he got a job with our Voice of America radio station. He explained to me how they beamed their radio signals into Russia and to China uh, to get the American uh, word out. Uh, and the first question he asked me was, did any of your relatives come to Okinawa after the war to help us? And I said, yeah, my uncle was there as an interpreter. Uh, and he thanked me for that. And so apparently they were treated quite well. And I, I don't mean that they were given food and stuff like that, but I think they were treated respectfully. Uh, that's what I got from the conversation I had with him. Uh, it, it felt really, really good. In fact, somebody came over and said, I need to take a picture of both of you because uh, we seem to, um, I, I, I forgot the word that the person used, but they said, we, we, we seem to really get along together. And I wanted to see that. I wanted to see how, you know, we as Westerners who try to analyze everything in the world, uh, we often forget to enjoy what we're doing, right? You know, if you're sitting in a car and you're going somewhere, if you're looking at your mileage to see how many miles per hour you're getting, it's on and on and on. You forget to see the scenery outside your window to enjoy the trip. And they're enjoying the trip, and we're analyzing what's on the dashboard. See, <laughs> <laughs> I, I I looked at it that way, and um, I I really enjoyed it. Gwen, I I really appreciate her going up and sharing the the hula with them. They were all up there, every one of them. Uh, and you can do a hula for us also. Then I, I didn't hear you. What was that? Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe you can. Both do a hula for us later in the show. Yeah. And so, you know, one thing you said though is, uh, you know, you know, you think about hmm, what's happening now, what's happening today. Think about living life. That's one of the lessons of all this. But you also said a little while ago that you you have to have a mission. You have to have a purpose. Huh? That's part of that's part of the Okinawa uh, Okinawan yeah. thing about about living a long life. So, did you always think about that when you were there? Did, did you ask yourselves uh, what, what your purpose was, what kept you going? And what did they say their purpose was in keeping them going? I'm just wondering if you got down to the detail on that. No, we, I asked the interpreter that question and um, our guide, I should say. And um, she, she already knew the answer, that they, they live life. Um, they don't really think about why I'm living long or and on and on. Now, in the past video that I saw on the Blue Zone, 
uh, they did talk about how each person in the village has a job, a responsibility. And this is not uh, patronizing them or anything. They, if they don't do their job that day, uh, it affects the village negatively. They're, they're responsible for some function. If you're in your 90s, what could a job be? What, what would you be assigned to do? Uh, the woman that they interviewed uh, on that um, video, uh, her job was to gather um, the food from the gardens or something like that. Uh, her, she had the job of making sure that everything was gathered and getting it ready for the villagers. Uh, something like that. And mm -hmm. You know, Gwen, I'm, uh, Alan's talking about food, and that's always a central point in travel, certainly in, in Japan and Okinawa. How did you like the food in the Blue Zone? What was it like? Well, I had heard before, my uncle is Okinawan, and he loved bitter melon. And I tend to, I kind of like to, you know, try different foods, and I have I love bitter melon now, and that's a big part of their diet. Uh, bitter melon with egg or tofu, and there's a lot of roast uh, pork. We ate a lot of pork uh, as part of the meal. And then there's also this thing called sea grapes, which is not, which are not grapes. They're seaweed, which have little polyps on it. And that's an industry now that um, I guess it's been there a while. And we had uh, sea seaweed every morning and I forgot the name of it. It's kind of been a, a mixture. Uh, I forgot it, but every morning I had that. And then I had um, sliced pig feet every morning, pickled pig's feet. And that became my diet. So I tried to eat at our hotel, the collective, um, every morning to eat typical Okinawan food and enjoying it. And I did. And, you know, the saying is, and I saw it on the Netflix video of Okinawa, that they eat 80% to uh, uh, to full. They don't eat 100%. They eat 80%. And it's called Hachibu something. Arahachibu. Arahachibu. So, um, and that's part of the secret. You eat only 80%. You don't overstuff yourself. You don't get the big gulp. You know, it's... <laughs> You eat moderately, enjoy their food, and, you know, um, eating together, having fun um, is a big part of it. And I, so one of them said they exercise together in the morning. And um, so, you know, a lot of it is contributing to the whole. Um, not everyone being individual, but seeing you know, themselves as part of a whole. Um, mm -hmm. I think that adds to the, their life their lifestyle, their long life. But my takeaway was not so much living long. My takeaway is living well. Watching them, I'm thinking, it, to me, it's not, it's not a number of, you know, living long. Uh, I rather live well. And, you know, I know my mother-in-law felt when she died at 102, all her friends were already gone, you know, and as she had beds, they were gone. And so... You know, I don't want to live long just to live long. I want to yeah. live well. Yeah. So what, you know, I want to explore the uh, the society in the village, so to speak. You know, the, you were in one village, you guys. You went to one village. Now, I presume you stayed at that same hotel the whole time you were there. Um, and when you were there, you could have the run of the village, but you would also meet people and have gatherings. How did it work? And what did you learn about their society, the way they relate together as a, as a village. We we didn't get to really see that uh, because our vi our visit with them was, uh, I would say, what four hours, Gwen? About that, yeah. Yeah, it was four hours. We were in Naha, and we had to travel hour and a half uh, all the way up to the northern village. Ogimi is in the northern part of Okinawa, so we didn't really get to see their daily uh rituals uh what they did and everything like that it, it was at a time to just get together like visiting friends and family and, and sit around and interact with them it, it was delightful it was how did you were you introduced to them were you thrown oh, yeah. into a social experience with them how did that work 
we we were uh, we all introduced ourselves. In fact, um, it was fun to do that. I, I got up and introduced myself, and at the end, I said, "I want to live to be a hundred fifty year old man." And Takeshi turned around and he grabbed me by the shoulders and he says, "It shook me," and he said, "Daijobu, daijobu," <laughs> meaning that you're all right. You're gonna live. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, that was really nice. That was really nice. I, I enjoyed chatting with him because he had so many things to talk about. It, it didn't seem like I was talking to a 92-year-old man. He, he seemed like he was 65 or 60. You mentioned before that you had a, a translator there. Were you talking in, uh, in English, in Japanese, uh, or through a translator? Yeah, we had a translator. She's the tour guide, um, uh, Seiko. I did all our uh, translation. She was a marvelous um, guide. She knew history of Okinawa. She had a love for the history of Okinawa. Uh, and she gave us perspectives of the history that made us think that maybe they shouldn't have been part of Japan because they, they were their own kingdom there. And uh, <laughs> I'd love to see that. Sovereignty. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And so when did you did you take tours? Did you go around? <laughs> did some did your tour guide organize little day trips or day you know visits to um, you know uh, the temples or what have you? Is that part of the program too? Uh, no, well, we went to a site that is no longer. It was a site of a um, was it a castle? Uh, Shuri Castle. Shuri Castle, yes. And it was, of course, it was gone. And it was raining and pouring. And uh, it was, I mean, it was educational. Um, but I, we didn't really visit any temples. And, you know, I've gone to Japan several times before, and I saw a lot of temples. But this was more meaningful places that we went to. And I appreciate that. Um, I wanted to say also that when we first went, my expectation was more of a fact point, feeling like I want to know. But then after a while, and in that four-hour period with them, it was more like it evolved into people just having fun and associating with each other. So all of the other questions fell away, and it was just having some camaraderie with people. And the beautiful thing about it is when we left, after we had done the... Um, learned our Okinawan dance and we did that hands in the air dance anything any way you want cel celebration dance uh, we're going to the uh, bus everyone's climbing on board and at that entrance there's that one shy lady who said I'm shy but I love to dance she danced us to I mean almost like her farewell she kept dancing and we were all clapping and having such a wonderful time um, she felt comfortable enough to dance. And that I thought that was the beauty of it. Um, you know, fact-finding, good to know. But here it is. We can, human beings communicating with each other. And I think that was... Did, did you know all the people in the tour? Had, had you met them before? Or were they, you know, new acquaintances for you? Like Art and Reen. I mean, like Alan, rather. I only knew Art and Reen. And one person of the group of 20... He lived across from me where I grew up, and I recognized him, but that's all. We, we didn't know each other at all. And When you say that you were having fun, I, I get the feeling that the fun was not just with the people who um, you know were local in Okinawa, but it was fun among your group, too. Yes. And yes. everybody got involved in the same way that you did. Uh-huh. Um that that is so true and that's why everything the whole package was such a worthwhile experience you know everybody having fun exploring together um and that's why it was a different kind of tour yeah well that's, that's a the lesson for travel in general isn't it you know relax put the guidebook away and just see how it how it flows around you and enjoy the things of the people that you run into i I've had trips like that. My wife and I have gotten lost <laughs> and discovered things we would never, ever have discovered if we hadn't gotten lost. 
Yeah. Uh, so, Alan, uh, I just want to uh, make a kind of, I want to punctuate the fact that we have a lot of photos from you guys. And at this point in the video, uh, we'll put the photos, we'll put, you know, we'll put the photos in and we'll see some of your photos of the trip. Okay. Um, and the other thing is, uh, this trip was not limited to Okinawa or or that village. Uh, what was the name of the village then? Ogimi. Uh, Ogimi. Ogimi. Ogimi village. Um, but you also went to Tokyo. And boy, that's like uh, coal and ice, isn't it? Uh, I mean, Tokyo is uh, all, uh, you know, gusa gusa. Can I use that term? Uh, <laughs> Everybody running around, uh, lots of action, lots of maybe too much action, and lots of shopping and money at restaurants. A different, a different experience completely uh, from uh, Ogimi Village. So, Alan, can you can you tell me what it was like to go from one to the other? Actually, uh, I got amazed in Tokyo by these phenomena. You got to see this when you go there you get a group coming off of two different trains, large group of people, and they will merge without changing their velocity of walking and, and just merge, intersect with each other and, and come out on the other side. It, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch. And when we went to see the uh, statue of uh, uh, Hachiko, the dog that was uh, loyal to the owner and waited for forever and passed away, there's a little, uh, there's an, not little, there's an intersection there that has six streets that come together and thousands of people just merge together and come out on the other side without stop. You know, you know, how when we walk here in Hawaii, we kind of hesitate and we slow down, we go around people there. They just flow right across. <laughs> Amazing thing to watch. And the other thing I wanted to add about Tokyo. It was 36 degrees on a couple of days there. Mm -hmm. And one of the most magical things was to find a tiny little hole-in-a-wall restaurant that holds maybe 10 people. And you go in there, and, and you get this hot uh, bowl of miso ramen. And you eat it when it's cold uh, outside. It, it just tastes about 10 times better than you ever tasted any ramen. You got to do that. Yeah. Uh, I think Gwen and I both had the miso ramen, right? And then we are We're slobbering all that. over. The, well, that's that's good, and that's how the way you do noodles too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you slurp it, but not yeah. only slurp. So, yeah. how how would you compare the food in uh, Gimi Village and uh, Okinawa with the food that you found in these uh, hole in the wall places in Tokyo, Gwen? Well, and um. At the uh, Ogimi Village, we had a, a set bento, um, authentic Okinawan food, a multi, multi course in the bento. We couldn't finish it. Uh, all the, um, uh, I guess, favorite foods of Okinawa. And so uh, that's what we did there. Uh, in Tokyo, the food was, you could have Korean. You could have, you know, it's a wide variety in a Tokyo. Um, but um, my main reason to go to Tokyo was to find cherry blossoms. And, you know, if the timing is always wrong or right, you know, so we missed a lot of the flowering, except in the Shinagawa um, area, there was uh, one of the hotels in the Shinagawa um, group of hotels that had a uh, blooming uh Sakura, and so I I went. Alan went. A couple of us went to see it at night with that miraculous lighting. It was so beautiful. But during the day, um, I was always searching for um, cherry blossoms. And then one tiny alleyway, you look down, and there was one tree with the pink blossoms. And it was towards the end of the season and the leaves are just fluttering down and it was so beautiful. That made my trip to Tokyo. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that was... Little, in that little garden, there were 17 different kinds of uh, sakura and plum blossoms. And there were only about four or five in bloom, but it, it was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, I, I think Japan itself is beautiful. 
the culture is just really fantastic. The way the people conduct themselves is, is safe. And right now, given the exchange rate, it's cheap. Did you, were you surprised with the prices, Alan? You know, you can get um, that miso soup for just a, a a buck or two. Am I right? Oh yeah, I would have paid twice as much as I did. Uh, it was so reasonable, and of course, being that it was so tasty, you you, you feel like uh, it, it's worth a lot more. But I think it was the thirty-six degree temperature outside that made it. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, so I think uh, I would like to ask you this, you know, so you had an experience, you saw both places, you could make the comparison, you could enjoy the group and, and having fun, not only among the group, but with people around you in o Ogimi. Um, what about other people? What about, say, somebody in college? Um, what's your advice to them? Should they do this trip? Should they go to Japan now? Should they go to Okinawa? Um, they're not going to be so interested in living to 100. They're not going to be so, so interested in, you know, in examining the lifestyle in a, in a blue zone village. Um, but what would you advise them, Gwen? Um, would you advise them to go? Would you advise them to go now? What would you tell them to look for? What would you tell them the takeaway is? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say to, um, you know, Whenever you go on a trip, you do a little research before you go to find out what kind of place it is, uh, and then to go with an open mind because uh, it is very different from Tokyo, and don't expect it to be like Tokyo. You know, it has its own beauty, um, culture, and if you and a college student, who knows if they like the light life and all of that, they may they're going to be searching and they. Probably can find only a few places. Okinawa has its own beauty, and the history of Okinawa is amazing. Um, some sad stories too about the struggles they had, um, but it it was so rich with um, a flavor of Okinawa, and be open to that. Tokyo, on the other hand, is totally different, and yet there's so many different places in Japan that you have their own stories. You know, they have their own flavors, culture. So I would say if you're a traveler, just be open always to anything. And, you know, you always learn from any experience, bad, good, um, you come away with something. Yeah, I'm reminded that um, Art and Rin Kimura have been to Japan. Are you ready? Are you sitting down? 55 times. 55 yeah. times. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's got to be one of the most important things in their relationship together over the over the course of their marriage. So, Alan, what would you add to what Gwen said about the advice you would give to a younger person um, about going and what to look for when you're there? Yeah, I would ask everybody to go to another country without any expectations of being entertained or to have a certain amount of something for the money they paid. Uh, when you go there with that expectation, I think it, it totally changes the way you look at what you're doing, who you're interacting with. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to quantify and qualify your expenditures. So I would, I would want people to go to another country and understand the culture, to empathize with their values and their priorities. I, you know, un understand why a culture is different. And it's not the same as ours. Um, I know when I went to China and I had to use a outdoor pit bathroom, it was quite an experience. I'll never forget how it felt to do that. And how it smelled. You appreciate what you have. <laughs> 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 you know, the other thing I want to add is that along with all the enjoyable things we did, uh, we did visit places that were really sad. Um, like the Peace Memorial, where mm -hmm. a lot of the, uh, the people in Okinawa jumped off the cliffs because they were they didn't want to be captured by the Americans. Uh, we went to the girls' school where a lot of the uh, young girls were uh, asked to provide medical services to all the soldiers that were in the field. Um, and in Okinawa, I mean in Japan, we, um, Green and Art took us to. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm going to not pronounce this uh, 
Anyway, that's where the 47 Ronians are buried. Uh, the name just escapes me right now. But anyway, uh, you know, to be there and to understand that these 47 Ronin warriors uh, with devotion, loyalty, and great honor uh, rev took revenge on their lord that was unfairly treated or insulted. Um, the, you know, they're, they're sad moments, but it really tells you something about what life is all about. Well, we're out of time. I We got to go now. It's been great to talk to you guys. But as I promised earlier, we're going to have one final <laughs> challenge. So I I, uh, I can't sing, but so you will imagine music, appropriate music. And if you could both just give me the hand motions, uh, you know, for the hula uh, that you oh. did at Okimi. Just that, you know, humu humu, nuku nuku, apu apa, you know, that kind of, whatever. And uh, can you, okay, uh, ready, go. Okay, humu humu, nuku nuku, apu apa. This is a fish swimming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm glad you showed them that. And I think the people in Ogimi will never forget what you showed them. <laughs> I think so. They were very um, taken with that. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. Gwen Nose and uh, Alan Okunaka. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a great Thank discussion. You. We've learned a lot. And Thank I wish you me. well. Take care. Hello. Hello. Like this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel? Thanks so much.